the forest sector in the country is still with the good old management strategies which are inadequate to empower the students and faculty to face challenges pertains to environment biodiversity conservation therefore it is high time to change our priorities of research and education policies in the present scenario of climate change and consequent environmental problems in this context we would like to bring together the experts in india and abroad to deliver serious deliberations in these lines so that a conceptual document can be prepared and submitted to the university and government for implementation with this background we have organized this international webinar series on forestry and environmental education in india from 11th september to 9th october 2020 in the first phase we have arranged five speakers who are dr shibu jos director and associate dean university of missouri usa sri noel thomas ifs inspector general of forest moefcc government of india on 18th september dr cts nayar ifs retired former principal secretary science and technology development government of kerala on 25th september and sri abhilash dam first central academy of state forest service dehradun on 1st october and finally dr mm animon forestry officer fao region office thailand on 9th october so this is the schedule we have arranged in the first phase and we would like to have a second phase also later with these few words uh, let me enter into my responsibility of welcoming the dignitaries of this webinar series our beloved vice chancellor has kindly agreed to inaugurate this webinar series but uh, it is unfortunate that uh, he has got an immediate meeting with the uh, minister therefore he will be joining later he told that uh, he will be joining after dr shibu's talk uh, and he he will definitely interact with the participants so on behalf of faculty and students of this college i extend a very warm welcome to honorable vice chancellor to inaugurate this webinar series starts from today to 9th october i take this opportunity to welcome the respected guest speaker of today dr shibu jos director and associate dean university of missouri usa and also as uh, no as we know alumnus of college of forestry kerala agriculture institute to, to this webinar welcome dr shibu to this webinar i extend a very warm welcome to all dignitaries including professors scientists students from different universities of india and abroad to this webinar we are very happy to disclose that we have received immense response from the participants and we have been forced to register our re registered participants of this webinar to maximum capacity of 250 we have arranged a facebook live streaming also to those who are unable to attend this google meet once again i welcome all the participants and dignitaries attending this particular webinar thank you thank you all over to dr kunyamu please thank you dr vijay sagar am i audible sir is audible okay okay sir uh, respected uh, vice chancellor uh, dean college of forestry and uh, my friend uh, uh, has already explained uh, the background of this webinar series and uh, he has also pointed out the impending need for uh, streamlining the education sector in the country which is very much age old and redundant rather Uh, so we need to uh, change our educational priorities in fine tune with the changes that are that are happening and the challenges that are happening across the world so in this context i'm sure that uh, this webinar series will be giving you a good highlight on uh, what are the changes that are happening across the world and what are the research priorities that are not the, the priorities in uh, research as well as education uh, in the country uh, so that uh, at the end of this webinar series we will be able to to give a document a document which uh, definitely will be further uh, subjected to further deliberations and we will fine tune a strategy uh, 
uh, for the 21st century, a forestry education strategy for the 21st century. Uh, in this context, it is, it, is me, the me, it is very much imperative that we should know what is happening across the world. That's why we thought that we would have first a, 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 a analysis of what is happening across the world, especially in the European and American uh, countries. Uh, so that uh, we probably that may give us a lot of uh, leads and lessons for shaping our educational uh, policy or rather strategy. Okay. Uh, so in this context, uh, uh, I have uh, immense pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, Dr. Shibu Jos. Probably without saying you all know about Shibu, he is one of the towering scientists in the international scenario in the field of natural resource management uh, and uh, especially the research on uh, agroforestry and agroecosystems. I'm particularly privileged to disclose that he is one of the prodigious alumni of uh, College of Forestry, Kerala Agriculture University. And uh, on a personal note, on a personal note, I'm proud to say that uh, he was my classmate during the BSc graduate program as well. Well, uh, Shibu is uh, presently the Associate Dean uh, for Research in the College of Agriculture. Food and Natural Resources, and the director of the Agricultural Experiment Station at the University of Missouri, Columbia, USA. Well, uh, prior to his uh, current appointment, he was the director of the School of Natural Resources at the University of Missouri from the period 2017 to 2018. Again, uh, His Excellency Garrett Endo Research, I mean, Chair Professor, and the director of the Center for Agroforestry uh, for a period from 2009 to 2017, and the professor of the forest ecology at the University of Florida. Now, coming to uh, Dr. Shibujo's uh, his achievements, he received his uh, uh, bachelor's degree from, as all of you know, from College of Forestry, Kerala Agriculture University, mm -hmm. India, and his master's and the doctoral degree from College of Agriculture, Purdue University, uh, USA. He has received a massive fundings uh, for his institution to the tune of around $46 million. And uh, he has published 11 edited books uh, and nearly 200 uh, research articles with over 8,500 citations. And uh, all are in rated international uh, journals. Also, he has around 14 uh, PhD. 37 masters and 27 postdoctoral uh, visiting scholars uh, uh, into his credit. Uh, I probably you all know very well that he serves as the editor in chief of the um, most famous agroforestry, the journal Agroforestry Systems, the premier journal in the field of agroforestry, published by the Springer Nature, and he is the editorial board of uh, a large number of number of uh, uh, several of journals. Uh, very importantly, he is the current chair of the research advice council that advises the. So we are so much fortunate, fortunate to get such a very uh, uh, high-rated and uh, uh, very important personality uh, to discuss to 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 address us today. Uh, the topic given to his natural resources education and uh, research in in twenty a North American perspective. So uh, I hope that uh, he'll be discussing on the curricular and research trends in the U.S., particularly focused on forestry. With these uh, remarks, uh, I welcome Dr. Shibujos to make his presentation. I, uh, the, uh, I would request everybody to keep your, uh, uh, your device in the mute position right now. And uh, after the presentation, Probably we'll be getting some time to 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 have a, a discussion over over his about his presentation. So over to Shibu Jos. All right, let me try to share my screen first. Please, please. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yeah. 
on the way i think yeah ah, yeah it has come shibu all right well yeah 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 first of all um thank you dean dr vidya sagar for your warm welcome and thank you dr kunyamu for again for your generous introduction appreciate that very much well good morning everyone first of all i would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers for thinking of me and inviting me to be part of this exciting international webinar series it's indeed an honor any time when you receive an invitation to come back to your alma mater or by virtually this time but particularly when the invitation is to come in and and give a speech and so i appreciate it very much what i would like to do today is to speak a little bit about the evolution of natural resources education in in north america over the past 120 years a lot of it is historical but a bit of that is from my own experience of being a student, a faculty, and an administrator at four different land grant universities with strong natural resources and forestry programs in the US over the last nearly three decades. And of course, I owe a great deal of gratitude to the College of Forestry at Kerala Agricultural University and my professors and mentors who trained me well so that I could, in fact, come to the US and pursue my master's and PhD and my professional career here in the US. You trained me well. I will start off by I will start off my talk by giving a brief overview of our college, that is the College of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources here at the University of Missouri. Well, some of you may be wondering where is Missouri? You can see a map of the United States here. And what is marked in red is the state of Missouri. Missouri has got about 6 million people, only a sixth of uh, the population of the state of Kerala. If you look at the GDP, I would like to draw your attention to an interesting fact. What I have written here as ANR stands for Agriculture and Natural Resources. Agricultural and natural resources contribute $88 billion to the GDP of the state of Missouri. And if you add tourism, $17 billion, that is about 35% of our GDP, which is substantial. I'm trying to set the stage to show that how much the state of Missouri appreciates its agriculture and natural resources and related tourism. So that's why our college and our programs, including the natural resources programs we have, they are extremely critical for the economy of our state. So now you can see here that we have five divisions in our college plus one school. That's how we are structured in our college. And by the way, we are part of the University of Missouri, which is one of the six most comprehensive universities in the country. So when I say comprehensive, that means we have like a college of agriculture, College of Engineering, College of Medicine, Wet Medicine, Arts and Sciences, all of this under one roof. Almost all the programs that you can imagine, we have 12 different colleges. 
and several schools covering almost all the the majors that you can imagine under one roof that's why we call ourselves as one of the most comprehensive universities in the us and we are one of those 12 colleges on our campus all on one campus so if you look at our college we have five divisions and one school and i have listed those here the animal sciences applied social sciences biochemistry food systems and biological engineering school of natural resources that is the one school and plant sciences and i had the pleasure of being the director of the school of natural resources before i moved into this role as the associate dean of our college overseeing our research enterprise so we have about 300 faculty in our college and about 400 staff members and if you look at our student body we have 2300 undergraduate students pursuing all sorts of majors in these divisions and one school and then of course we have 400 graduate students i also oversee our farms and centers that is what we call the ag experiment station covering 14000 acres scattered all over the state and we have 18 of them and most of them with staff but some of them also with faculty stationed at these off campus locations and if you look at our research enterprise that's about 50 million dollars strong that's the extra mural funding that we bring in to run our research enterprise. So with that introduction, I also would like to show the rich history of our college when it comes to agriculture and natural resources. I particularly included this because as a student of forestry, studying at the College of Forestry at KAU, I learned some of these things. For example, I learned about Rothamsted as being perhaps the longest running, not perhaps, the longest running soil experiment in the world. But after coming here, I also learned that the second and third longest running soil experiments were here in the US. And I never imagined one day I will be overseeing one of them. The Sanborn Field, the third longest continuous soil experimental plots in the world. I also learned as a student at KAU about the universal soil loss equation. Again, I never imagined one day I will be overseeing those plots and they still exist. Not all of it, but at least a small fraction. And that's where the original research was conducted that helped develop the universal soil loss equation. It's just a few hundred feet away from my office. Well, we all know about the moon landing. And you may wonder why I included the moon landing picture here. Hope you can see the picture. Well, it was Dr. Charles Gerke, one of our faculty members, who analyzed the moon rocks. When Neil Armstrong and Aldrin brought the moon rocks, they were sent to the University of Missouri soil chemical labs, just maybe less than 10 feet from my office here. That's where they were analyzed for science of life. And it was Dr. Charles Gerke who confirmed that there was no sign of life. And I'm fortunate to oversee that lab today. It was one of our scientists, George Radai, along with Dr. Barbara McClintock, who started using Arabidopsis as a model plant system for genetics. So for some of you who are molecular biologists, I'm sure you are using Arabidopsis as a model plant or model plant system, most likely the variety called Columbia. And there is a reason for that, that Columbia variety is named after this particular college town, Columbia. And Barbara McClintock later on would win the Nobel Prize. 
Well, I never imagined that one of my own colleagues would win the Nobel Prize. That happened a couple of years ago. Dr. George Smith won the Nobel Prize right here. His building is right next to my office building. And he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for his discovery for phage display. Again, those of you who are into biotechnology, molecular biology, I'm sure you know all about phage display. I just wanted to give this historical context because every university here and every university in India and every university everywhere in the world has a rich history like this that they are proud of. And these are some of our pride points that I wanted to showcase since they are related to some of the things that we do in the world of natural resources and forestry. So with that, let me at least take you to some of the grand challenges that we are facing in the 21st century related to natural resources. Well, a few years ago, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, that is a prestigious uh, association here in the US, we call it APLU, they came up with this, a team of scientists came up with these grand challenges for natural resources in the 21st century. Dean Dr. Vidya Sagar outlined some of the challenges that we face. And I think almost everything that he talked about, you will see in this uh, diagrammatic representation here. Well, I will start with the sustainable management of uh, social ecological systems for goods and services. So the realization that it's not just the goods that we expect from forests, it's also the services, the ecosystem services. And I'll come to these points later on. So let me just briefly go over, just list these grand challenges because it may not be easy for some of you to see these grand challenges represented in this diagram. The second one is protecting and conserving watersheds for biodiversity and water resources. A grand challenge indeed, not only in the Indian context, all over the world, we are recognizing more and more the importance of protecting the watershed. And we now realize conserving the natural resources is the basis for sustainable agriculture. Well, the third one is impact of climate variation on our environment and society. The fourth one is environmental responsible agriculture. The fifth one is alternative renewable energy sources. And the fifth is natural resource education and leadership. Of course, you have recognized this particular one as a challenge the need to change with time. Otherwise, you would not be organizing this series, this web series now. It is timely that, that you are discussing about the future of natural resource education. Well, these are all complex challenges and we need both interdisciplinary as well as transdisciplinary approaches to solve some of these complex challenges. That means we need to train the next generation of future professionals. We need to equip them. And how do we do that? Well, through our institutions. In terms of training them in academic programs, in terms of training them in research, but also in terms of training them on the job so that they can, they can try to solve some of these complex challenges that we are facing. And foresters cannot alone resolve these issues. That's why these inter and transdisciplinary approaches are more relevant than ever before. We also need to rely on citizen science. I'm sure it is being used in India, it is being used all over the world, and of course, we are also relying more and more on the citizens to collect the data, to help us 
the resources are limited. I mean, financial resources. So volunteer citizen scientists are essential in many things that we do these days. And lastly, the team science. Well, it's not new, but the way we talk about team science is kind of new. It's a group of people from different disciplines with ideas coming to the table, putting their brains together to solve these complex issues. Well, so how are institutions responding to these challenges? At least I will speak for our institution. We have set up hefty goals. For example, you will see here, we have established a goal. And that was like last year to double our expenditure in research. In other words, double our efforts in research. Why? First of all, as I said in the previous slide, some of these challenges require us to come together from multiple disciplines to solve these issues. That means it costs more, perhaps, to do that kind of research. So if you look at the grand expenditure, this is the research dollar. Well, research FTE, FTE means full-time equivalent. So if you look at a one FTE in research, that would be a person doing 100% research. If you look at the dollars that they spend in their program for research, per FTE, you will see it is steadily increasing for us. And there is a reason for that. Research is more expensive, especially when you do the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research. It becomes more expensive. And funding agencies are realizing that. So there are more grants now available that are over half a million dollars. When I said earlier about 22, 23 years ago, that was not the case. But now more and more you are seeing grants that are in millions of dollars. And I, I will show you some examples in the next few slides. And here is another important aspect in terms of a 21st century research that we are focusing as an institution and other North American institutions are all doing the same thing. And I'm assuming that other institutions in other parts of the world, including in India, are also doing the same thing. That is giving more emphasis on translational research leading to economic development. As I said, you know, we are a land grant university with three distinct mission areas, research, teaching, and extension. Well, about 14 years ago, we added economic development as our fourth mission for the University of Missouri. That shows how important that mission is for us, and we are emphasizing that over and over. It takes some cultural change, but still we are promoting translational research. That means bringing out more patents, invention disclosures, and trademarks, and even starting startup companies. We are promoting that more and more, taking the research to the marketplace. Again, for benefit of the society, and we have established a goal last year again, you know, to double our intellectual output in terms of patents and trademarks and startup companies, again, double by 2025. So I will show you some examples of the, the kind of 21st century research that our researchers are involved in. And I'm showing some examples, not just from forestry, but also from, broadly speaking, natural resources and even related agricultural sciences, because it's critical. Like I said, we don't, we don't, we don't work in, in a vacuum anymore as foresters or natural resource scientists. We work as a team, and that sometimes involves people from 
animal sciences, people from social sciences, people from engineering, and from medicine. And on this particular slide, I included some examples, like for this one, for example, we received $8.6 million recently, last year, as you can see here, to establish a new center, a center for swine somatic cell genome editing. Why is that important? Well, that is the future, folks, genome editing. And I will show you an example a little later here, but that is the future. We talk about climate change and responding to climate extreme weather events, climate variations. That means perhaps producing trees and plants that are drought tolerant or flood tolerant, disease resistant. Well, gene editing is the tool, tool of the future. And even in animal agriculture, that is being used heavy. And we have this program run by Dr. Kevin Wells and Dr. Randy Prather, and they produce more transgenic pigs for biomedical applications, as well as for agricultural applications, than the rest of the labs in the world combined. So it's an outstanding program that we have. So I just wanted to showcase the, the power of gene editing. Some of you may be using that already, but if not, it's time to think about that and bring your research along those lines so that we can accelerate breeding programs for particularly for plants, for food, as well as for natural resource conservation and restoration. Corinne Valdivia from our Division of Applied Social Sciences, look at one project that she brought in, helping businesses to recover and be resilient to natural hazards and disasters. And we go through that periodically, even here in our state, because we have two major river systems, the Missouri River and the Mississippi River. And we periodically get severe flooding that would damage crops and that would destroy structures and, and kill people and livestock. And so it's nothing new to the state of Missouri and helping businesses to recover from disasters like that. Well, water and nutrient recycling, a decision tool and synergistic innovative technology. That was a $4.3 million grant for Dr. Tang Lim from our biological engineering. And you will see something here that we have faculty dealing with forestry or natural resources in other divisions. So they are not just confined to the School of Natural Resources. They could be in, in our Division of Applied Social Sciences. They could be in our Animal Science. They could be in Engineering. They could be in Plant Sciences. And look at this particular project, systematic evaluation of cellular export from plant cells. Basic research done by Dr. Bing Yang. And here are some examples of inter and transdisciplinary projects. Dr. Chapman from biochemistry is acquiring a cryo or cryoelectron microscope, $4 million. Dr. Mitch Wigman in our School of Natural Resources recently received two grants. One to look at factors influencing wild turkey and the other one looking at environmental conditions and and how do they impact American black duck behavior and movements? A total of $2.4 million. So these are big grants, and these are not the only individuals working on these projects. These are large groups, people coming together from multiple disciplines. For example, in this case, a bird person working with an animal person, working with a habitat person, an ecologist, and a GPS person and the landscapers and coming together to address complex issues. Michael Stamba, world-renowned fire ecologist, 
And this is a small amount, but I just wanted to show this as a one example of a consortium that he has put together. And here is another one that is very relevant. And this clearly shows the transdisciplinary approach that we are using. Dr. Chang Huo Lin is a forester. He has his BS degree, MS degree, and PhD, all in forestry from the University of Missouri, from the School of Natural Resources. But look who is working there. This is Dr. Mark Johnson, a professor from our School of Medicine. And look at the project that they are working on. Early detection and tracking of COVID-19 in wastewater. They can simply look at wastewater from sewer systems and, and figure out the extent of uh, the infestation. So, Dr. Lin was using his knowledge from his discipline, applying that in a medical application, working with Dr. Mark Johnson. And they just got a million dollar and that project is currently underway. I just wanted to show the transdisciplinary approach that we are taking. And, and you could think of this as a COVID-19 issue, but you could also think of this as a water issue, but as a health issue. It's a perfect example of a forester helping to detect COVID-19 in wastewater. And here are some examples of translational research. Clearly, cutting edge technologies developed right here. So I'm just giving you the example from my own institution that actually went into the marketplace or just getting into the marketplace as we speak. Here is another technology, again developed by Dr. Chang Ho Lin, the forester, because of his molecular expertise, because of, because of his uh, microbiology skills and biochemistry skills. He was instrumental in patenting one of his inventions and there was a company as a spin-off. Look at what they are doing right now. This upcoming growing season, they are expecting 40 million acres of corn grown in the U.S. alone as a result of this one invention that led to a seed coat treatment for corn. It's called Poncho O2 O2, marketed by BASF, one of the companies in the world. So just people coming together from multiple disciplines to solve problems and creating technologies that are already in the marketplace. And here is another one, a pregnancy test was developed for cattle, again, based on an invention right here. I talked about gene editing. So using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, Dr. Prather's team created a pig that is resistant to a disease that affects the pigs when they are young, which costs the industry about $6 million every day. That is $2.5 billion a year worldwide. If they can bring it to the market, well, of course, there are regulatory hurdles anytime when you talk about a transgenic pig or a transgenic plant. I don't need to explain that to this audience. You understand it very well. But if we can bring it to the market, that's going to be purse resistant pigs as a result of the gene editing technology. And they are working with Genus to bring the purse resistant pigs to the marketplace. Here is one of our recent successes beyond meat a technology to make soy-based chicken substitute. Now you can get burgers, chicken from fast food restaurants based on the Beyond Meat technology. That company has a production facility right here in Colombia. Within a short period of time, they are valued at $8.5 billion. It's a small company but technology that was just developed here. 
now changing the way we eat. And think about the connection to natural resources. If we can produce food that is like meat-like from plant proteins. Anyway, so so much for research and the 21st century directions. Let me shift my focus to the educational part of it. So producing society-ready graduates for the 21st century. I put this diagram here again just to remind all of you that, yes, that is one of the grand challenges, natural resources, education, and leadership, changing with time. And I would like to start with this one graph here. If you look at it, you will see, I would like to draw your attention to forestry first, because many of you are with forestry background, like me. So let's start with that graph. And here it is in green. And if you look at the 80s, or the 70s and 80s, that's when forestry kind of hit its peak in terms of enrollment of undergraduate students. And this is based on data from 31 institutions all the way through 2010. And you will see that it hit its peak in the 70s, but by the time early 80s, it started sliding. And then, of course, in the mid 80s, it started picking up again, but then it plateaued in the early 90s, and then it has been going down and, and kind of leveling off. As you can see, for the last 10, 20 years, it's leveled off. And I will show you more recent data in the next slide. But let's start with this. But at the same time, I would like to draw your attention to this particular line here in purple. Hopefully, you can see the purple line that started very low here. You can see like 2,000 students enrolled in 1980 in natural resources and environmental kind of degree programs. It stayed pretty much like that through the 90s, but then in the 90s, it shot up. And it leveled off, but again, in the early 2000s, it started going up again. So forestry has been going down, but these environmental science, natural resources program enrollment has been going up. Why is it so? Let me show you another graph. And here you have the proportion of undergraduate enrollment in natural resources, again, at 31 institutions. And you will see this forestry in 1980 had 47% of those total enrollment in all these disciplines. And you will see that includes wood science, recreation, fisheries and wildlife, forestry, soils and geology, range science, watershed, but if you look at the proportion of forestry, forestry was nearly half of all these students enrolled in all of these kind of natural resources related discipline all over the US. See what happened from 1980 to 2009, from about 50%, it, it became only about 22%. Enrollment has been declined. And that's been a problem. But look what happened at the same time here in natural resources and environmental science disciplines. In 1980, that was about 15%. And look what happened by the time 2019 data came up. Well, it was more than doubled it was 35%. And it's even more than that today. And, and here is the recent data. And if you look at some of the other programs like wood science, it has remained steady over the same time. But look at forestry. That also has kind of 
if you look at the absolute numbers, remain steady, at least for the last, well, nearly 15 years. But look at what happened to a couple of other programs. The one in purple, that is again the natural resource conservation and management. And look at the yellow line, that is the environmental science and studies. And this data came from 61 institutions. And this is the most up-to-date data that we have to show the, the trend in natural resource enrollment over time. And I'm showing you this for a reason. So what is prompting all of this? Well, part of it is changing societal demands. Part of this is changing expectations of employers. And there is one more reason, which you will see me list next in the next couple of slides. But let me tell you that that is the changing expectations of prospective students. So let's see what has been happening, at least in the US context, in terms of forest management. There has been a major paradigm shift in natural resource management over the last 120 years of the history of the forestry in this country. It used to be focused on a commodity, a single commodity, timber. And now we have gone through the phase of ecosystem management to the newest line of thinking, that is considering our ecosystems as social ecological systems. And I will come to that in a second. But let's briefly visit this historical shift in paradigms. So timber management was the only focus when forestry started in the US 120 years ago. Mostly, again, just like in India, and perhaps in many other parts of the world, influenced by German foresters. We could call that phase as the exploitive phase. And then, of course, we became aware of the wildlife and habitat focus. And that was the time when we also started protecting. And we could call that the administrative phase. And then came the multiple use management. Oh, we need to simultaneously manage for timber and for wildlife and perhaps even for water. Well, that morphed into the ecosystem management in the 90s. So when I first arrived here, right after my BS degree from KAU, this was just being talked about. But then in the mid 90s, it became the predominant philosophy. Well, more recently, in the 2000s, we've been talking about the social ecological systems. And I call it the social phase. And why is this important? And I'll come to that in, 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 a, in a few minutes. But, well, when the paradigms kept changing, it required a change in the way that we started managing our forestry or forest resources or our ecosystems or now our social ecological systems. So who are the people managing these resources? And how are they being trained? Are they ready to tackle these new paradigms in management? Are we training them so that they can be the best natural resource professionals who can solve these complex challenges that we face? Well, that is a question that I'm posing to all of you. And I will, I will tell at least the experience that we are having in the US. But before I move into that, let me explain the social ecological system. 
Well, you are quite familiar with the social ecological system concept, I hope. And what is the difference between that and the ecosystem management? Well, when we moved from ecosystem management to social ecological system, we realized more and more the importance of us, human beings, as part of that ecosystem. We always thought about the ecosystem as something that did not include us. We were always trying to manage it from being outside of it. Well, that has changed. Not just here. It's changed everywhere in the world. We increasingly recognize the importance of us as part of that system. And the influence that we have over all of its components, the geosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and of course, the entire biosphere. We recognize our footprint and we are trying to do something about it. The climate change or extreme weather events, the soil erosion or the loss of productive soil. Well, the water. I don't need to explain the importance of water to this audience. And it's not just unique to India. It is unique everywhere. As I said, we have two major river systems, the Missouri River as well as the Mississippi River, running through our state, Missouri. And you would think that, oh, we have plenty of water. And I told you about the flood that we get every so often. Well, folks, it's not just the flood. We also experience severe droughts, not enough water. So it's not just the floods. We go through these extreme weather events. So we all understand now our role in controlling the ecosystem. And we are, the society is part of that. So our increased awareness led us to look into this philosophy of managing our natural resources, treating the entire ecosystem as the social ecological system with humans being an important and integral part of that system. Well, I included this because it's so critical, so relevant. And this is what the business we are in, trying to protect our natural resources and trying to sustainably manage it for future generations because we recognize the survival of human civilization depends on the life supporting goods and services that are provided by healthy, coupled social and ecological systems. We recognize that more than anybody else. So it is upon us, that is our call of duty, not only to conserve, but come up with ways so that we can manage it sustainably for future generations. So I also would like to showcase something that is positive that has happened as a result of this paradigm shift from a timber production philosophy to the social ecological systems. We have seen this nice trend in terms of gender diversity in natural resources disciplines. So if you look at the enrollment, you will see that we are getting more female students now. So you can look at these, at least these two numbers. There are more female students being enrolled in environmental science and studies. And of course, we see a modest increase even in forestry. Well, I remember when I was a student at KAU, well, only male students were admitted back then. Of course, that has changed. That was not the case here, but still we saw a lot of male students enrolling in forestry programs back then, but it's a nice welcome change that we see a lot of female students also now getting enrolled, not only in forestry, but also in related environmental sciences disciplines. 
So how are institutions responding to the demand from society or from prospective students, potential employers? How are we responding to these, these needs so that the students that we graduate from our universities, from our institutions, they are equipped with the right tools to tackle these important complex issues, not on their own sometimes, but even by working as part of a group or a team? Are we training them properly? Are we producing society-ready graduates? Well, I will briefly outline some of my own experience, but also what we have seen over the, over the years. Well, this is one strategy, revising the curriculum. I'm sure all of you are doing the same thing. But some of us are even changing degree names. And some of us are creating even new degrees. And sometimes creating new majors and minors within existing degrees. And you may wonder, what is in the name? You know, why, why worry about the name so much? Well, it makes a big difference. When I was at my former institution as a professor, I remember that some of my students told me that, yeah, they would not go for a forestry degree, but they would be glad to enroll in a natural resource conservation degree. So we had NRC as a major. It was under the same degree, Bachelor of Science in Forest Resource Conservation. But the students, because of that major called natural resource conservation, Oh, yeah, they would enroll for that program, but no, no, I don't want a forestry degree. There was something about for some students because we didn't do a good job telling them that, no, it's not all about production. It's not all about timber. We have come a long way. But still, that name, Natural Resource Conservation, attracted a large number of students into our degree program. Well, some of us are changing names of colleges schools, departments to reflect the new demand, the new expectations, particularly from prospective students and society. So we are adding terms like environment, conservation, natural resources in the name of the college or the department or the school. So I will get into these in a bit more detail over the next couple of slides. So revising curriculum. But before I delve into that, let me at least explain the way we are structured in the US. So a North American BS is typically a 120 credit hour curriculum. In some states, you cannot require students to more than 120 credit hours to get a degree. So it's kind of standard now pretty much all over that most programs require students to graduate with 120. But students on their own can take extra classes if they want to. But a curriculum, you have to offer, and you have to guarantee that if you finish these courses, 120 hours, you get a BS degree, or a BA for that matter. And 60 hours of that 120 should be what we call the Gen Ed, the general education credits. And usually that is finished during the first two years, what we call the freshman and sophomore years. And they should include mathematical sciences, natural sciences like physics, chemistry, biology, geology, etc., humanities and fine arts like language, history, arts, music. I'm not saying all of these are required, but you will have a certain number of credit hours depending on the nature of the program. And then you take those classes. Social and behavioral sciences, including a civics course, like economics, anthropology, sociology, psychology, and then, of course, written and oral communications. So you need to prove that you have a certain number of credit, making up to 60 credit hours before you become a junior. And that's when you start focusing on your discipline, your major let's say forestry, for example, and you focus on those courses during your junior 
and see in your ears. So the 60 credit hours, that's what helps you, helps you become a forester or a wildlife biologist or a natural resource scientist. And in the US, the Society of American Foresters accredit forestry programs. So for many jobs that our students get after they finish a forestry or a natural resource related degree, they will see opportunities for them to get a job, but most of those jobs will require them to graduate from an accredited forestry program, accredited by the Society of American Foresters. So for us, that is kind of the gold standard. I wanted to mention that because I want to show you how the accreditation process changed over time. So early on, as you can see, it started back in 1935. Early on, they required specific courses like civic culture, forest ecology, forest management, forest economics, forest utilization, dendrology, just like the way that I went through a training of forestry, just like the way it was structured when I first came here in most of the forestry programs. You take these few classes as part of your last two years primarily, and then, then you get your accredited forestry degree. But that also included a lot, lots of, you know, lots of hands-on training. Something called a summer camp used to be a requirement, but in most programs that's no longer a requirement. That was a summer long program where they picked up a lot of the practical skills in the field. The way that SAF accredits forestry programs now is based on the demonstration of competencies in four subject areas. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second, but they also accredit both urban forestry and natural resource ecology and management degrees or majors. And some of them won't be titled exactly like this, it may be a natural resource conservation degree, but you could still apply under this particular accreditation, it has got a slightly different standard, and then you can get accredited. So switching to competencies, what does that really mean? In the past, let's say they required silviculture and forest ecology, specific titles, specific classes, but now, all they're looking for is, do you have this particular broad subject area covered? And it could be covered in a number of different classes, biology and ecology, for example. And here are the expectations. So if you read this, I don't know if you can really read this, I don't wanna spend time reading through, but maybe I will just read this first one. Understanding of taxonomy and ability to identify forest and other tree species. That's like taxonomy or dendrology, but it may not be called dendrology. You may take that as part of a taxonomy or, or some other plant ID class, but it doesn't have to be necessarily called dendrology anymore. Understanding soil properties and processes, hydrology, water quality, watershed functions. Well, that could also be part of a couple of different classes, one related to watershed, one related to soils but it could all be in one class, something like a general ecology. Understanding concepts, principles, including ecosystem structure and function, communities, competition, diversity, population dynamics, succession. Well, that is a description of forest ecology, but it doesn't say that you need to have a forest ecology class. I used to teach forest ecology for an accredited program at my former institution. I also taught silviculture. Look at the next one, ability to make ecosystem forest and stand assessments, and then understanding of tree physiology. Well, that doesn't mean they have to have a class titled tree physiology. It could be a plant physiology they take from a plant science division or from biochemistry, but 
they need to pick up that competency, not necessarily a particular class titled tree physiology. I hope you understand the difference and the transition from requiring classes titled in certain way to looking for, are you competent to understand these concepts? Are you competent to apply these concepts? Are you competent to make decisions based on your understanding of these concepts? That's how, how it has evolved. Maybe hard to believe, but we are talking about the same forestry training. But now it's done in a different way. And here, measurement of forest resources, number two. Number three, management of forest resources. And number four, forest economics, policy, administration, and law. Well, there are also expectations outside of those four or included within those four subject or knowledge areas. For example, a lot of emphasis on hands-on experiential learning. That means a lot of field work working as individuals but also as groups solving problems there is a strong emphasis on ethics there is a strong emphasis on oral and written communication you need to demonstrate through certain classes that you acquired both the oral and written communication skills and it could be part of your ecology class it could be part of your silviculture class where you have a lot of writing, you have a lot of presentations. So the emphasis is not just technical knowledge, gaining and applications, but also practicing your oral and written communication skills. Technological literacy, not just computer literacy, but all sorts of technologies. Well, that field is changing so rapidly. In many applications, you better be a computer scientist in order to, to, to really solve some problems in forestry, right? So we expect them to, to be technologically advanced when they get a degree, even in forestry or natural resource in general. But here is another big one, analytical and critical thinking and reasoning skills. Well, folks, this is a big part of what we emphasize. And that is critical for them to be able to solve problems and to make the right decisions. So by the time they are ready to graduate, they are well versed in solving problems, in working in teams. They have the confidence and the employers like them. They hire them right away. So that is kind of the new way of thinking when it comes to training the next generation of natural resources professionals. But the competency-based curriculum also offers flexibility for us. A number of forestry programs, including our own program that I was part of, which I had the pleasure of overseeing because Department of Forestry was one of the four departments in the School of Natural Resources. But we went through a restructuring and during my time, we went from having four departments to just one school. One school that is well integrated without the departmental boundaries. People were free to work together, develop curricula, work on projects, promoting the inter and transdisciplinary approaches. Because we realized that these complex issues, every brain from every discipline is critical to come to the table so that we can solve it together as a team, as team science. Well, like I said, some of us changed degree names. And, and a good example here is what we did as part of our restructuring. We don't have a forestry degree anymore. What we call is a natural resource science and management. That is our BS degree but then students can specialize and get majors in forest resources and terrestrial ecosystems. And that is kind of our social ecological systems major. 
They can also go for fisheries and wildlife sciences or human dimensions. The important aspect. We joke about this here, and, and I don't know whether we do that in India, but foresters often say that, oh, I chose forestry so that I can get away from people. I don't need to meet people. I don't need to talk to people. I don't need to see them. I deal with trees, and I deal with animals. Well, we have come a long way from that mindset. Now, forestry is, as you all know, because I know you deal with this every day, especially the professionals. The human dimension aspect of forestry management is more important than ever before, not only in India, but everywhere in the world. So we understand the importance of that. So we just created a new major called human dimensions, which is very popular. And some colleges or schools and departments have added new degrees. I gave you this example earlier. The natural resource conservation is a good example. Or some of them, like us, we added environmental science as a new degree option. And that is our fastest growing major in our School of Natural Resources. And of course, it gives flexibility in terms of including more courses from allied disciplines like environmental science, natural resource management, wildlife and fisheries, soil science, atmospheric sciences human dimensions, because these are all important when you think about forests as a social, ecological system. Then you won't think about just forestry classes. All of these topics from the allied disciplines become critical, including, you know, think about the recreation and tourism, of course. A lot of people use forests for that reason. And I don't need to explain that to this audience. Well, I also would like to, to show you at least some examples of uh, selected competencies, skills in the new revised curricula that you would see all over the US and in, even in Canada. Ecosystem management. That was not a class when I went through, or even when I came here, that was not a class. But now you will see in some programs, oh yeah, that is one of the core classes they need to take. Human dimensions of natural resource management, social ecological systems, sustainable management of social ecological systems, ecosystem restorations, principles and practice, soil health, environmental informatics, Valuing ecosystem services. It's not just quantifying, but also how do you evaluate, you know, how, how do you find value to clean water and clean air provided by forests? Environmental economics, environmental justice. There was a recent conference that talked about the changing landscape when it comes to natural resource education. And these were some of the topics they emphasized: experiential and service learning creating synergies of research and teaching. As the guy overseeing the research enterprise in our college, that is music to my ear. Integrating research into teaching. Well, I need to admit that even when I was a student in the late 80s at KAU, there was a lot of emphasis in our curriculum on research as part of our training. And I'm so thankful for that early conviction that research was important, which led me to a research career. So it, it makes a big difference when you introduce research into an undergraduate curriculum. Incorporating traditional ecological knowledge, something that is becoming more and more important every day traditional ecological knowledge. And I often tell this story, some of you have not heard this, so I will repeat it here. When social forestry was very active, I was in fifth grade and I brought a sandalwood seedling. And my grandma pretty much told me not to plant it where I was going to plant it. To me, it was very special. So I decided 
that I would plant it in the front yard, somewhere in the middle, where there was nothing else. And grandma said, no, it needs a mom. Well, I argued with her because my grandma only had a fourth grade schooling. I thought I was at least better than grandma. So I argued with her that, no, come on, grandma. This is just a seedling. It doesn't need a mom. Humans need a, ma a mom, not, not, not plants. Well, in the end, grandma won. And she made me plant the sandalwood seedling near another tree. Well, she only knew that it needed a mom. It was much later when I was a forestry student in the College of Forestry there, I learned that sandalwood was a hemirood parasite. Well, you all know that all too well. Well, grandma didn't know the scientific reasons or the scientific basis, but she had somehow that traditional knowledge that was passed on to her from generations that it needed a mom to take care of that, that young seedling. Well, we have a lot of traditional knowledge that's past disappearing or already disappeared. It's true, not only in the Indian context, it's the same here too, everywhere. But incorporating that traditional knowledge is becoming more and more important in present day forestry and natural resource management. Maintaining depth with expanding breadth I talked about a lot of breadth, but I want to make sure that we are not sacrificing the depth. It cannot be simply an inch deep and a mile wide. When we train our next generation of natural resource professionals, we need to ensure that they have the depth that is necessary to make them successful. So changing names or changing degrees or changing the curricula don't mean that you need to dilute the training that you are providing to the next generation of professionals. Well, here is one thing that often being criticized for diluting the quality of programs, online delivery. Well, it's not a bad thing. I have developed two different online master's programs during my time, one at the, my former institution, University of Florida, and one here at my current institution, University of Missouri, and both are successful. But I was told when I was thinking of developing these programs that no, that's not possible because it's, it's forestry, it's restoration, it's agroforestry. How can you teach people online? Well, there are a lot of things that they can acquire in terms of practical skills in the field by working with a professional. But sometimes what they lack is the scientific, the foundational knowledge. And you can deliver that very easily. And of course, COVID-19 has really brought us to online all over the world, just like this <laughs> webinar. So we recognize more and more the importance of this medium. So hopefully there will be thoughts along the lines, if nothing else, as frequent continuing education opportunities for professionals in the field to equip them so that it's not like they learn about something five years too late. They learn it maybe in five months that, oh, something that we learned, well, they can apply that right away in their decision making. Climate literacy standards, enhancing diversity, keeping pace with technology, retooling or adaptive skills for a rapidly changing job market. And some of it goes back to what I just said about continuing education opportunities for our professionals in the field. We all learn things every day. I'm amazed by how many things I learn every day. I got a really broad, but also deep training from the College of Forestry. I'm always thankful because in my job, as I said, I oversee the entire college with all those divisions that I explained earlier. What does that mean? At least I need to be somewhat knowledgeable in animal science, in plant science, in biochemistry, in engineering, 
in natural resource, in social sciences. Well, I'm so thankful that I got such a diverse training. I took classes in almost all of these. Well, I took additional classes when I came here because it, my, my, my foundational training during my BS degree gave me the confidence to, to go after some of these other classes from these other departments or divisions or even colleges. So I feel so fortunate that in this position, I understand things. I may not be an expert, but at least I can appreciate research done by our faculty in our college. And even some of the related research happening in other colleges. So, breadth is important, but at the same time, you also need to have disciplinary depth. But then you need to be able to adapt for the rapidly changing job market. Well, I'll just give you a few examples of changing college school department names. Why did some of the, the universities go after this way, you know, this approach? Well, to attract students. And I told you about the perception that some of the students, potential students, have towards the word forestry in some cases. Look at that Yale, the Yale Forestry School. That's how it started. And that is one of the oldest, the oldest perhaps, you know, I think it is in the US, 1900. That's when it was established. And look at the current name. They used to call themselves as the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies up until last year, but they changed again. Now it is Yale School of the Environment. But it's not just a change in the name. It's also reflective of what they do, how they train. University of Minnesota started out as a College of Forestry in 1903. Now College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resources. They merged with the College of Agriculture and, and accepted this new name. And, and see, there is no forestry, it's natural resources. Iowa State, there was a Department of Forestry in 1904, but then in 2002, they changed to Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management. Look at Virginia Tech. They were also a Department of Forestry in 1925 when they started, but in 2009, look at their complex name. Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation. The name change means a lot to a lot of our potential students. I don't know if that is the same in India, but here it, it matters quite a bit. University of Florida started out as, as a Department of Forestry in 1935. But in 1971, they were one of the earlier adopters of these changing philosophy. They changed from Department of Forestry to School of Forest Resources and Conservation. And University of Missouri, my own university. We started out as a School of Forestry in 1957, but now you know we call ourselves as a School of Natural Resources. And that name came to effect in 1988. So we are also one of the early adopters of this changing philosophy. Well, I need to emphasize that it's more than just changing the name. And I would like to use again our School of Natural Resources as an example. When we abandoned the departmental structure, we used to have four departments and department chairs. What we ended up doing was we created three spheres. Faculty could identify themselves belonging to these, these three different groups. Water resources, terrestrial ecosystems, and environment and society. I'm not suggesting all of you do things like this, but just wanted to show you that we wanted to make sure this name is reflective of what we do in our school. And then we changed our degree names. We changed our graduate degree names. So it's reflective of what we do, which is important. So it's not just a name. It shows exactly you know, how we are structured and what we do and our degree programs. Well, 
Is that the final change? I cannot foresee what the future holds. I don't have a crystal ball. We are still evolving. Our college is celebrating its 150 year anniversary this year, 150 years. As a college, we are still evolving. Our degree programs are still evolving. And here is, this one is one of our latest examples of how we changed to meet the needs of society, to meet the needs of the profession, and to respond to the demands by our potential students. Well, the tagline for our 150-year celebration is golden legacy and bold future. I know you all have a golden legacy in every program that you represent on this call. But we often need to think about the future in a bold way, because that may upset the conventional thinking. And sometimes that is necessary so that we can make progress. And I would like to emphasize that we are still evolving. The natural resources discipline, not only the, the teaching, the academic side, but also the research side. And I gave you some examples. Both are rapidly evolving as we speak. So if I give you the same lecture, maybe five years from now, I may be talking about things totally different. I'm telling you things as they exist today. So I challenge all of you to think along those lines, to constantly revising the curriculum so that we are up to date when we train the next generation of future professionals managing our precious natural resources. And that way, we produce society-ready graduates who are equipped to meet the challenges of the profession. We cannot foresee what are the complex issues they may be tackling over the next five years. 10 years, 15 years. But we know if we train them, if we train them to adapt and change rapidly, give them the confidence, make them the critical thinkers, they will be successful. And that is the best we can do as professionals, as educators, as researchers, and as students. So again, thank you for the opportunity to Talk to you this morning. Appreciate it very much. And Kunyamu, back to you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah. Dr. Kunyamu, our uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor with us now. So uh, I request uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor to say a few words to this webinar. Uh, Dr. Shibujos already talked about a lot of things which is which has to be appreciated by our university also. Sir, please. Respected uh, Dr. Shibujos, just at the back end of your talk, uh, I could actually listen uh, to your presentation. I am hope I am audible. Yes, you are. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was in another uh, meeting, yeah, another meeting uh, with our uh, Honorable Minister for Agriculture as well as Honorable Minister for Health. So I, my sincere apologies for that, for this uh, overlapping of two different webinars. And uh, for your information, uh, Dr. Sibu Jos, actually I am a postdoc with Dr. Henry Wen. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so Henry well, is a great colleague of mine, as you know. So I understand. So I will convey so, uh, your regard yeah. to Henry. Yeah, world is uh, too small. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, I really appreciate. Actually, I had a few points uh, to talk for this uh, uh, webinar. You know, the forestry and uh, environment education. As you rightly pointed out in the last few, I think three, four PowerPoint slides. Uh, see, I really appreciate bringing this uh, during your uh, presentation. You know, I was actually um, in 2011 and 12, I was a Fulbright scholar in uh, Cornell University. Okay. 
So I was working in a department of plant breeding and genetics. And of course, there were department of biotechnology and uh, many other things, botany, zoology, uh, other things. That uh, within a year uh, of my return, my professor uh, told that uh, I am no more, no more a chair of uh, the department of plant breeding and genetics. Now I am a professor in a department of integrative biology. So all those departments have been uh, integrated. And actually, that's how they actually told we need to change depending upon the needs of the society and the environment. I also look at uh, this not only in the Western uh, Hemisphere, even in uh, Japan, University of Tokyo. It is a natural resource. It is nowhere in agriculture, forestry, or agronomy separately. I still I remember a student who did PhD and he got a degree PhD in agronomy, but his whole thesis in biotechnology. We were all working with Henry Wen, and that is in Texas Tech University. We started our uh, uh, relation with the Professor Henry when he was in Texas Tech Lubbock. So long back, that is 1994, and still today we maintain a good relationship and. Uh, personal association with Henry, convey my regards. And coming to this uh, webinar topic, I think the forestry, we have always a feeling, you know, the forestry colleagues, the forest size is actually dwindling because the land is going to agriculture, urban and other industrial uh, uses. That will be the uh, scenario in the years to come also because the population increases, the demands for food and other needs also increases industrial needs also increases so how to actually you we want to protect encroachment into forest but i would see i see the world is moving towards bringing forest into urban settings the urban greening if you see the uh, national parks board in singapore there is a department you know urban uh, greening and ecology they want to actually bring forest into urban uh, metropolitan cities I think that will actually, they say it will uh, increase the resilience of our cities. Now we are actually seeing floods, landslides, even the forest fires in the California now recently happening. In, we saw in Australia also. So we need to bring the forest into everywhere, not confined to forest uh, ecosystem alone. I see the benefits of are, I think, innumerable. Only one thing I want to quote because I am basically a plant physiologist. And I always love photosynthesis, the process of photosynthesis. We are talking about climate change, global warming, and we see the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is actually contributing to this global warming. I see plants going to mitigate. They are the only thing, sizably they can mitigate this carbon dioxide buildup in the atmosphere. They take carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis and they give us back the biomass, whatever you take cereals, grains or millets, proteins or whatever it is, they give back that carbon dioxide converted into carbohydrate, protein, fats, etc., which is required for the human race and animals. And not only that, they also give plentiful oxygen. They actually purify the air. So the forest ecosystem, its the importance from the process of photosynthesis, I say, it is sequestering the carbon that we produce through our uh, all other activities, biological activity as well as uh, industrial activities, they actually sequester that carbon and convert that and go back into useful thing. And also they delay the climate change or global warming. So that is the importance of forest ecosystem and also agriculture or plant ecosystem. So much is also carbon dioxide captured through planktons in the ocean also. So we need, while we are focusing the importance of forestry, let us not actually isolate the forestry from our other settings, agriculture, urban, and other settings, even a co coastal ecosystem. We how to build the, the forest ecosystem in our vast coastal lands across the uh, global uh, coastlines. You know, we have Mars, we are talking about Mars ecosystem, land ecosystem. That itself is a specific ecosystem we need to nurture and develop in all our uh, coastal ecosystem. Every year we see. The Alapula area, the, our people who are living in the coastal lines, they are actually putting into hard strips and several crores of rupees are actually uh, uh, diverted into bringing, protecting their dwellings from these tidal waves. So why not we can actually develop this kind of, uh, protect the uh, coastal lines using a green corridor that can be done. So I think 
the importance of forest or the natural resources as what dr jose has rightly pointed out now it is all the more increasing in the days to come due to climate change and the needs of the humans and other industry needs and needless this has to be given in education at the right the our young students who are the future leaders or protectors of this society and the natural resources i think this use of these natural resources are protecting the forest how to actually conserve the forest and also make use of and create useful products for our daily use within the forest ecosystem and gradually bringing the forest back to our agriculture lands and urban setting even we say uh, urban that is called edible urban uh, gardening these things are actually many newer uh, concepts are coming we need to take this into our scientists as well as, uh, as students so that they can take up uh, these case studies or new research in initiatives so that we can give viable policy interventions to our government to interact and uh, uh, really i appreciate all the speakers and experts for their valuable time and also you are sharing your insights during this uh, webinar i thank my colleagues dean forestry and other colleagues in the college of forestry of course it's one of the best of, uh, school in forestry across the country still they are actually divided across uh, departments so even they don't want to lose one identity as a one department and it is right that uh, dr jose has given it is a time to integrate but not further segregate i think the new education policy probably dr jose might have been uh, knowing about, uh, something about that we want to uh, bring all the universities just like you know land grant system universities in us you see, you see in one carnal university they offer agriculture law medicine pharmacy veterinary what not why can't we do that in carnal agriculture university of course we may lose the identity but that is the need of the hour if we don't change the society of the time will uh, force us to change so we need to see there is a scope or opportunity in this uh, change and we will try to actually grow and uh, develop ourselves and also the institution also develop with these few words i really uh, appreciate uh, for organizing this webinar and also thanks uh, dr jos and all uh, and the next few days also i want to listen to other experts i think uh, um, i think a series of webinars i want to listen to other experts also and dr jos if you can share your powerpoint of course since uh, my apology for asking this uh, if you can share the powerpoints i think uh, i am learning so i want to learn uh, newer things thank you very much well th thank you dr chandra babu i will send my powerpoint to you uh, and i again i'm so glad you reminded me that you know henry wen henry had in fact told me about it a few months back but i had forgotten about it so yes. thank you for reminding me I, I will convey your regards to henry thank you thank you appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Punyamu, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Continue. Thank you. Uh, very good response uh, uh, to the the presentation by uh, Dr. Shibu just. In Shibu's presentation, I I have uh, Can you hear? Punyamu, we cannot hear you. You are breaking yeah, up. Mike, yeah. Mike is getting uh, muted. It is still muted now. Can you hear me? Oh my God. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me? We can barely hear you, but there is echo in the background. Hello, can you hear me right now? Yes, please continue. Okay, okay. So uh, I'm so so much glad that Shubhu uh, made a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was it was an exciting presentation, and uh, it was definitely in the expected lines uh, of uh, our thinking. Okay. Talked about the uh, uh, you have talked about uh, the need for the the, the bringing changes in the curriculum. Is, that is uh, very much in fine tune with the uh, the needs of the society. Uh, that was very much interesting. And uh, in fact, uh, in our college, uh, in our university level, we have made a lot of changes in the recent changes in the curriculum. 
bringing a, a kind of uh, inclusiveness rather than exclusiveness we made uh, most of uh, the, the the branches put together within an umbrella so uh, bringing a lot of uh, emphasis on environment environmental studies conservation natural resource management so uh, we have been revising the curriculum in that fashion but definitely we your your uh, speech or rather your presentation gave us a lot of insight into the way we are going to change our uh, uh, our uh, uh, policies especially uh, with respect to the policy education in india india so i am very much thankful to you for uh, giving such an exciting presentation uh, i am also uh, thankful to all the uh, listeners Uh, learned uh, persons who, who attended this particular uh, important webinar. Uh, I also, I in particular, I thank our uh, respected vice chancellor uh, for uh, uh, oh, even though uh, at, in the late hours he has uh, he has been fortunate to join and uh, he made a wonderful remarks about the uh, about the presentation and also about the, the topic. I thank you, sir, profusely. I thank uh, Shibudan also very much for uh, because you know he is a man that. Uh, Shibujos is uh, uh, it is it is uh, it's a, it's a late night hours in US. So he has been it's about 12:30 night, you know. Uh, so you just can think uh, the kind of uh, 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 care he has taken for us uh, by keeping live throughout the night. So thank you, Shibujos, for being with us uh, and for also making such a wonderful presentation for us. Thank you very much. I also take this opportunity to thank our dean, College of Forestry. Uh, for providing for for conceptualizing this idea and uh, uh, and uh, prompting us to start this webinar series, uh, I also thank all the other dignitaries. Dr. Handa is there, Dr. C. C. S. Nair is there, then uh, many other colleagues are there from uh, not only from Kerala but from other parts of the country uh, in the in the field of forestry and agroforestry. I thank you all very much for this wonderful uh, gathering. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kunyamu, how about the questions and uh, the, the, Dr. Kunyamu? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely, definitely. We have. We can spend some. Maybe some five or ten minutes for a question and answer session. Of course, we have a large number of audience, so I would suggest uh, to keep everybody in the mute position. And those who would like to uh, share some or some thoughts or some di some discussions with him, uh, can raise hands and then so that we can they can they can unmute and and speak. Better, uh, yeah, better. Kunya, yeah. they can actually uh, raise the questions or uh, points in the chat box so that uh, Dr. Yeah. Jose will be able to go through that. That it is there, sir. sir. Yes, sir. It is already there. We have that facility is there. It is yeah. there in the chat box that we will be sending to Dr. Shibu, and he can conveniently send that later. But uh, one or two. What about Dr. Dr. CTS? Hello. Uh, Dr. CTS, Nair. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much, Jose, for. Uh, excellent presentation i think uh, you covered almost uh, every aspect of uh, how forestry has evolved over the last uh, few decades and that uh, transition from timber oriented forest management to a completely different approach where we are looking at the whole uh, human and ecological system in, in its totality now uh, one thing i would really like appreciate is uh, you know we all recognize the need for change but uh, why is that i mean uh, like what you have described your system has changed rather rapidly and what we find is that the system we have uh, still sort of uh, remain bogged down in the traditional framework i mean I, i appreciate change is taking place but it is extremely slow uh, so we still work in silos and uh, i i remember i was in the kerala forest research institute as director and even at that time we are trying to sort of uh, promote interdisciplinary research and uh, one of the thing which i found was that it is extremely challenging for people to come and work together uh, okay. so uh, it's easy to talk about a lot about interdisciplinary but somehow we have created systems that uh, 
fail to sort of uh, you know uh, pro promote that kind of integrated work and i think uh, in most of our system we are actually promoting individual excellence not the collective effort uh, i think this is one problem i don't know what what's your experience you are familiar with all the systems now so what, what do you think about that well dr nair i appreciate your comments uh, i think you pointed out the rapid nature of the change here in the North American context, but I need to admit that it was not so rapid, considering that you know our academic training in forestry and natural resources uh, is rather having a short history, right? You know, we did not start the academic side of training. Of course, we have had forestry training, but that was mainly for uh, the forestry professionals, but not through the universities. But that only started in the mid 80s in India. So considering our rather short history, I think that we are also embracing change, you know, rather rapidly, but I, I, I fully understand what you are saying that at least from our context, it seems like, yes, even when I came here 30 years ago, things were rapidly changing. And of course, we probably embrace those sort of changes perhaps in the last maybe 15 years. So we are probably 10, 15 years behind, I would say. But right now, I think you know it's one world. Everything that's happening here, I think it's happening there at the same time. So it shouldn't take us that long if we haven't changed to embrace that sort of rapid change. And that was one of my messages that the world is changing so rapidly. If we don't change according to you know the, the world pace, then we will be left behind. Our training won't have much meaning at that point. And we face this every day. And a good example is you know the digital age of uh, agriculture and the digital age of natural resources. Because it's the digital, te digital technologies driving agriculture as well as natural resource management these days. And we are struggling to catch up. I'm sure that we are struggling in India also, well, all over the world. Technologies are moving much faster than what we can catch up with in terms of academic training. But that's something that we need to embrace. So the, the change, you know, the pace of change is rapid, but it needs to be even more rapid, not just in India, but even here, we also face some of the same challenges. But it is the reality that we are all facing together. Okay. And, and uh, you, asked about, you asked about one more thing about individual versus you know group recognitions. Well, even up until maybe 10 years ago, that was still the philosophy here. But now in every decisions that we make, for example, you are quite familiar with the US system, so you know the tenure system. So we give a lot of importance to interdisciplinary projects. So it's not just one individual's contribution, but the contribution and the impact of that contribution as a group. So everyone is getting recognized. And it is being given more emphasis rather than individual accomplishments, the group accomplishments. But that doesn't mean that as an individual, you don't need to get recognition. No, that, that's not what I mean. But the group recognition is also extremely critical. If you work in isolation, if you are in your own silo, no, that doesn't cut it anymore. Okay, Shibu, uh, Dr. Baba Kumar? Dr. Baba Kumar? Uh, hello. Uh, yes, Baba, Baba Kumar. Uh, for the audience, Baba Kumar, myself, are uh, classmates of Shibu. But uh, Gobagumar is right now our director of education, Shibu. And uh, Dr. Jamaldin is also here. So please, Gobagumar, please. Uh, Shibu, I have just typed a question there in the chat box. So, oh, yeah. What should, yeah, I think that uh, a simple reply would uh, be nice to hear from you. Well, again, you know, just, just the response I gave it to Dr. Nair, I think I, I would repeat the same thing that, you know, be willing to change. I, and it is painful, and I know that very well because I led our School of Natural Resources through some painful changes. It was painful for our faculty, 
painful for our stakeholders. And I had to travel all over the state explaining what kind of changes we were making and, and the basis for making those changes, trying to make them understand that these are the, the needs of the hour. And if we did not change, we will be left behind. We won't be the cutting edge training program that our employers like or our, our prospective students like. Then what will happen eventually? We won't have. I, I, it's not the same in India. I recognize that. It's not the same at KAU. But for us, it is critical. The competition for students is intense. If we are not cutting edge, oh, they will go to the cutting edge program they can find. Yes, they are not coming to us. So we have to change. And we changed. And change is always painful. Since I led that change in our school, I know that very well. But don't be afraid to think outside the box. Whatever we need to do in making our curriculum cutting edge, we need to embrace that. We need to move towards that so that if nothing else, our students are getting the latest. Okay, Dr. Dr. Handa, Dr. Handa, uh, Dr. Handa is uh, the principal scientist in the ACRP and agroforestry in the CAFRI Central Agroforest Research Institute. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kunhamu. Dr. Jose, thanks for an excellent talk on this uh, forestry education and giving a very good inputs. I think here also we need in our country to link our forestry education towards the uh, entrepreneurship also and to develop the skills. That is the main concern because most of the foresters still we are producing there towards the academic and research areas. The need to link them with the industry and this uh, plantations is that is the main idea which needs to be focused on. Well, Dr. Honda, I'm thankful that you made that comment because I emphasize that as, as part of the research part of my talk. And, and that is a cultural shift even for us. It's been there all along, but over the last decade or so, we've been emphasizing that more and more. And that is a priority for me as part of our strategic plan for the college that we just published last year. So if you look at that, it's on our website you will see that we are giving a lot of emphasis on that translational research. Because in the future, the academy and industry will have to work together. That's when the best results happen for the benefit of society. So I'm so glad that you recognize that as the need. Hopefully you will be moving towards that direction in the near future. Uh, Dr. Dr. Namir, uh, Dr. Namir, Dr. Namir is uh, right now the director of the Academy of Climate Change Education and Research. So over to Namir for a few comments. Uh, yeah, uh, um, first of all, uh, uh, let me thank uh, uh, Shibu Jos uh, for accepting our invitation. Um, uh, it's been a very impressive presentation. Uh, needless to say, it's been very impressive presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Shibu, I have uh, nothing to ask you but only to uh, congratulate you uh, for making uh, giving us uh, some extremely important uh, uh, points to uh, uh, ponder and you know consider in uh, our university i mean if, if not in the in their country so uh, i just want to thank you for accepting our invitation and making a very impressive presentation thanks Shiva. Well, thank you, Namir, for the, the kind remarks and, and nice seeing you. I haven't seen you perhaps after I left the college. That was almost 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so nice yeah, 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 yeah. OK, OK. Uh, I think uh, it's getting too late now. Not, only, not for us, maybe for uh, Shibu. <laughs> yeah, can, you, can, I, can, you, can I give one point to? Sure, sir, sure, sir, sure, sir. I think uh, Dr. CTS Nair, uh, nice to meet you. Of course, uh, yeah, just to, I want to, happy to learn that you are a former director at KFRI. So, yeah, just one point which uh, you are talking about this uh, teamwork or integration. Yeah, I think you are very, uh, very frank. You know, we are not like the Western system where uh, they need to change and they are very quick to change also. And uh, I still I remember. 
if you are not uh, compatible for teamwork you can't be in the uh, western universities but uh, here it is not the yeah. case you know as you rightly pointed out individual excellence is uh, put ahead of this uh, uh, teamwork but i actually um, uh, tell to my faculty to do teamwork but even when i pick pick the members of a team they actually pick the same people again again in a different uh, projects that again it goes to some kind of a homogeneous uh, kind of a thing so yeah. i think the uh, expertise across the uh, campuses and uh, it needs to be appreciated yeah we may have difference of opinion but when it comes to scientific expertise we need to respect them and we need to team up another important thing is the tenure track you know in the us i don't until your retirement you will be constantly evaluated and you are accountable what you actually produce okay. but in our system it is not that once you join as an assistant professor the job security <laughs> is there until retirement so this accountability that goes mostly self driven yeah so the system has to change the we need to bring up and because you know as i told you hire a very good faculty and there should be a very good working environment so these two things are very key which i learned from uh, western uh, universities but as you told i think we need to do, i think it will take time to change bring those things uh, things into our system of course we are doing it incrementally not uh, in uh, jumps leaps and bounds okay thank you thank, thank you thank you thank you very much. okay so thank you thank you so much uh, our respected vice chancellor for giving those tips and uh, let us hope that our university will be transforming to the kind of uh, change what is expected bringing more uh, more uh, cooperation and association cutting across all kinds of borders uh, i think uh, let us wind up here because it's uh, already a very odd hour for shibu no, maybe may not, maybe not for us but for him it's a very very odd hour and he has been with us for a long time. so thank you shibu jones for this excellent presentation and uh, we are sure that uh, this will give us a, a, a lot of leads into the kind of change that we are going to bring thank you so much for being with us uh, so far and i also uh, once again i thank our vice chancellor uh, uh, shibu jos and all our learned faculty cts nair sir dr handa ji uh, our uh, dean of course he was instrumental behind all these things once again my good thanks to all of you thank you very much